You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now. It's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts, Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionFit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. And now, get ready to hit the option block. All right, everybody. That rocking bit of tunage means it is time to rock out once again with the option block, your bi weekly source. Not so much bi weekly this week, or indeed next week. We got two left <laughs> for the rest of the year. We've got today, and we'll beam in one final one for you for the end of the year, the end of the decade. How crazy is that to say? Next Monday, as well, of course, we'll be off this Thursday. Let everybody enjoy a little post Christmas, post holiday glow. We'll be back again next Monday to break it all down for you. Wrap up the year. Look ahead to 2020. All that good stuff. Of course, I got ahead of myself. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com. So excited looking ahead. I forgot to tell you where we are here, of course. Coming at you live every Monday. and Monday this week. Usually Monday and Thursday. Noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern. You know how to get the live stream. Mixler.com, M-I-X-L-R.com. Place to go. Or, of course, after the fact, on wherever the heck you like to listen to your favorite podcasts, Keep those questions, those comments, those reviews coming. We do love to hear from you guys. And joining me on the program today, we've got Uncle Mike still on holiday assignment out there in parts unknown. But we are joined once again by that most steadfast of lobsters himself, the rock lobster, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi, formerly of the number one options mecca in the country, Maine. Now a paltry, a dismal number two. Well, let's see if he can make it back in 2020. Mr. Rock Lobster, how go things in the hinterlands, and how are your efforts? Regale us, sir. How are you planning to regain the top spot in 2020 in Maine, sir? Uh, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting out options made easy uh, YouTube videos, like, you know, five to seven minutes, just to answer all the simple option questions people have. And I will try to do it in a, a timely and helpful fashion for everybody. So that's I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna go YouTube on, and I want my I want my title back. I know what you also have to do. You have to have a computer keyed up somewhere, and it just has straight up to the generic Google homepage. This has options typed into it, and every time you walk by it throughout the day, it has to be on all day. You have to just hit enter. 
over. You have to just keep searching <laughs> just generic option searches over and over and over again. And slowly over time, because you're the one person in Maine doing it, it will reverberate throughout the, uh, the wilderness there, sir. And the, the next thing you know, you'll be back on the top number one in no time, sir. Yeah, that, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> we all have dreams. And we also are joined by the last emperor, Mr. Constantine Vrandapula, holding down the active trader hot seat from Fidelity. Mr. Last Emperor, how are things and how are your how are your dreams here for the new year as we're wrapping into the end of the year, sir? Um, everything is is uh, swell. Um, joining you today, I, I know that I was on Thursday, but um, my colleagues are out on vacation. I'm the only one uh, here today, and I'm actually going up uh, to New England tomorrow. So uh, going up to uh, your neck of the woods there. Uh, Andrew, I'm I'm curious if if you're kind of thinking about, you know, the uh, the, the 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 click farming, um, you know, for your YouTube videos. Are, are you planning on on hiring some folks to to be getting you some clicks, get you up there on the uh, the top of the charts for uh, for YouTube videos? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I could I could I didn't even think that far ahead. I didn't I didn't know such human beings existed. <laughs> Yeah, they're called unpaid interns. You should check them out. They're, they're great. And you should just, uh, <laughs> just go throughout Maine and say, hey, whoever wants to click on options for me, just get it going. Just get it going. Get that title back, sir. Because DC, I don't know what they're up to down there, but somehow they managed to wrest the title from you. We'll see if that persists in 2020 as we keep on rolling into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading, what's moving and shaking out here uh, for one of the final times of 2019. And, you know, as we're coming into a relatively quiet, truncated holiday trading week here, the markets are kind of... All over the place, actually. We're seeing S&P, once again, kind of actually the lagger, not even the Goldilocks. It's lagging everything else, only up about a little more than a tenth of a percent. We've got NASDAQ up about a third of a percent. And we got Dow. How often do we say that? Dow leading the charge to the upside, up four tenths of a percent. A lot of that upside driven by some more action from our friends across the street. Yes, Boeing, uh, given their much maligned CEO, the Heave Ho. That sends the stock, <laughs> at least the Dow, up uh, as well over there. But the stock as well, of course. Uh, he's not exactly a popular figure out there. I'll have to go peek after the show, see if the black SUVs are swirling and swarming out there in front of the Boeing HQ. You have to see. That's usually a good sign that there's turmoil <laughs> therein. Uh, so that's interesting stuff. Of course, our old friend, the Bix, actually getting a little bit of a lift today as well. Kind of that weird moment. We were talking about it on Ball Views. Last week, just what the heck's going on out there and how challenging it is for VIX to get markedly lower in this environment where the SPX puts are still bid, the calls are still cheap, a lot of other things going on with the VIX futures term structure, all this kind of conspiring to make it difficult for the VIX, the VIX cash at least, to drift markedly lower right now. And we're seeing that today. It's actually up about two tenths of a point to right around 1270. That pretty much puts it pretty much exactly up two tenths of a point from where it was this time last year. Our old friend VIX. Also drifting up a bit as well here, threatening that triple digit level again, right around 99 and three quarters coming into the show. And our old friend VXX also joining the party, drifting slightly up, kind of unched from where it was last year, right around a 15 handle as well. Let's go back out to the active trader hot seat, Mr. Last Emperor, sir. What is lighting up the tape in the fidelity land on this relatively quiet holiday week, sir? Yeah, guys. So, you know, for, for a relatively quiet day, we actually have uh, quite a few names making some big moves. So Fidelity folks are trading a couple of stocks that are right at the top of the list um, that I have actually have never heard before uh, or seen. Uh, so the number one spot is the ITCI, ticker symbol, Intracellular Therapies Incorporated. It sounds like, well, they're up about 200 percent. Uh, they've been halted for volatility several times today. A uh, huge jump on the news that uh, FDA approved their schizophrenia uh, treatment drug, I guess. So, you know, the, this is a name that is, is one, of the, <laughs> one of those names that generally has, you know, potentially either a, a huge um, uproar to the top side, right, or, or uh, the, the drug 
fails and and the company kind of you know uh, or, you know doesn't go out of business necessarily but uh, probably goes a lot lower the option markets were pricing in very heavy volatility in the monthly contracts I looked at them um, there were 360 percent um, annualized IV vol for a 30-day option so um, you know it's not that this I guess news announcement was unexpected um, option players were in there prior to this but you know nonetheless uh, stock is up $24 right now and and I was looking at upside calls it looks like um, you know the exchanges are already adding calls that are trading you know in the range of 30 to 50 um, stock was at thirteen dollars on Friday, so <laughs> so uh, you know new new strikes are coming up on the board, but uh, everything that was at or near the money uh, on Friday in the uh, January monthlies is up five to six hundred percent. So even with that you know amazingly juiced up volatility premium that was built in, I guess it moved by more um, and and. Uh, in one direction to the upside. So kind of a crazy name. Fidelity clients are um, split right right down the middle, 50-50, but it is a stock that is trading very heavily and very actively, about 3,000 orders on each side. So that's that's a pretty, uh, pretty big one. Uh, Boeing is number two. Uh, as you've mentioned already, Mark, um, you know, Boeing got those news. So uh, the CEO is sacked. Um, the stock is rallying 2.6%, up uh, $8.50 right now. Uh, Fidelity customers are leaning to the buy side, and that has been the case uh, even, you know, kind of in, in, in the face of the most recent troubles um, in, in the stock price action. Um, every time, at least, I'm coming on the show and I'm mentioning this name, Fidelity clients were leaning to the buy side. Uh, so right now, 56% buys, 44% sells. Uh, number three, uh, good old good old Tesla. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, last time I was on, you were you were talking about how interesting it would be and what is going to be said when the stock does hit 420. Um, and what Getting do you there. know, right? Uh, <laughs> a joke a joke goes out on Twitter and the stock is at 420, right? So, um, pretty insane, up 75 percent the year. Uh, I mean, just you know, an, an incredible. An incredible story that uh, turned from, you know, being very sour to, uh, you know, to basically back up there, those previous highs. I, I was looking at a longer term chart, uh, guys, and, you know, over the past couple of years, it's been trading with a ton of volatility, but relatively sideways, right, against resistances and supports. And, and uh, these last couple of weeks has really broken the stock out and up to... Uh, uh, to new relative highs that we haven't seen really over the past uh, two years. So interesting name. We'll see, you know, if, if the craze continues, uh, <laughs> what will come of it. But uh, it's, it's amazing that, you know, stock of this size can move by a, a dramatic amount uh, just on just on the uh, tweet, a joke, I guess. Um, the next one is Apple, and Apple is generally at the top of the list. Apple's been um, uh, upgraded. I think the price target for them three twenty-five to three fifty at Woodbush, and the stock is up uh, nicely, one and a half percent, up four four points right now. Fidelity customers are leaning to the buy side. Fifty-seven percent buys, forty-three percent sells. So you know, just looking at the top of the list, and uh, as you gentlemen know, we we kind of you know we get a list of the thirty most actives, generally mentioned three or four at the top but you know it's just amazing on the on a relatively sanguine day uh we know that we're in, into a shortened week here in the christmas week but you know companies of this size moving by you know a, a drastic amount is kind of uh uh not necessarily what i would have been expecting coming into uh this week especially you know with the rise uh in broader indices that we've seen over the past couple of months so uh, I guess it's good to see the bulls are are definitely out in parade for sure. For sure, indeed, and this also continues my and just reinforces my thesis that fidelity the fidelity legions just can't get enough of cheapy biotechs that you've never heard of because you guys just they love them. And any given day that ends in Y, they're slinging some 
sub ten dollar, usually pharma or biotech that you probably haven't heard of, and has some crazy drug coming out that apparently the fidelity masses are hip to over there. So yeah, who knew the fidelity legions so into your small little biotechs in and, and pharma names out there. Mr. Rock Lobster, not really into the biotechs and pharmas, but he's into a little thing called VIX and a few other things. Mr. Rock Lobster, what is lighting up your tape out there today, sir? Well, I, I put a little uh, graphic for you in the chat box. So when the little birdie speaks to you, you have a little reference. Um, so I, I got a questions about, we had Mark and I got questions in our, uh, option pitch show on Friday about is this like the Volpocalypse month of January uh, 2018 because we have SPX going up and VIX going up and part of the reason why we have the zone of the monk right that really low 9 to 12 range in VIX is that usually is the vol area where there is willing sellers of vol um where like people are selling puts, you know, and they're like, ah, we're selling it. It's cool. Everything's great. So before the Volpocalypse, we actually had those um, eleven, like low eleven ball numbers. So I sent the, I sent a snap to Mark, and that near term future was actually in the twelve handle on the twenty fourth of January, um, twelve twenty two actually. So so after after Vic's expiration. Um, we had a, a, you know, there the curve was pulled much down. So even if you went ninety days out, vol then was thirteen fifty seven on January twenty fourth, twenty eighteen. That's a ninety day vol number, ninety day future. If you go to the ninety day future today, that is we're looking at like April ish is more like seventeen twenty seven. Um, uh, you know, the 85 day future is 1680. So it's three and a half points higher. <laughs> so the market is bidding the future vol much higher than it did in uh, 2018 already. So this is more of everybody, I'm not going to say everybody, but the market is definitely more primed for vol falling for the market to fall, right? In 2018, January, it was like that month was crazy. We're going straight up. We had low VIX volatility. We had extreme realized vol. We were going those huge straight moves up. And we had very low future premium. So what I would say is it's it's a different uh, – and to me, when I look at vol, very much like different patterns emerge um, – just but there, but the patterns are similar to the type of market condition people are looking at. So right now, you don't have you have a bid for vol. There is some scaredness, right? There is whatever because the vol is bid. Two years ago, you didn't have that bid for the vol. Um, so that I think there's a slightly different uh, tone and flavor to what's going on. Uh, and that's that's what I would say. So that's where we are right now. Um, and, you know, you had a – and here's the funny thing. The February contract, right, which was the near-term contract, 1222, right, and then during the Volpocalypse, I think it settled like 30-something, right? It was probably one of the higher settled contracts that I can remember um, in the last, like, five years. So, you know, in, and now that – you know, that bid is there. So I think, uh, you know, people or there's there definitely bid for those options. And I don't know what everybody's waiting for. They're just waiting for all the good times to end or the trade thing to not happen or something like that. But they are, my view is, they are much more bid for a move now than they were then. Um, and Back then, the actual curve was under a lot of strain, meaning those future prices were relatively close to the cash for a long, for a pretty good time to go to expiration. So there is usually when there's compression in the futures, it's actually much, it's a much better tell of market movement than what we currently have right now. Sort of nobody was buying protection then and everybody's buying it now, if you want to think of it like that. So very rarely... There are things so well telegraphed um, going forward. So to me, I honestly think it's kind of bullish. If Tucson was here, he probably would agree. But um, 
I can't put words in his mouth because he's Uncle Mike. But uh, that's my take on Vol for right now. And I just think we're going up to we have a reason not to anymore. So uh, that would be that would be my take on the Vol. But I, that's I'm using Vol kind of as a as a bit of a backstop for that. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. I'm looking at your your data points you you provided here. Maybe we'll we'll copy these out and and tweet them out to the masses so they could see it. They're following along live. This is a a shot from the VIX futures term structure back on early January. It's not quite the same day. This is about a month later, January 24th of 2018. What's interesting in that too, Mister Rock Lobster, is if you look at this chart because you're right, they are pricing it out at the time that front future at 12 and a quarter, and then kind of getting up from there. And we think of you know early. 2018 as being madness, and certainly the tail end of January into February was. Uh, but uh, interesting stuff coming in. You know, of course, we had the end of the year. Everyone thinks of December as this tranquil time, but of course, a year ago, <laughs> which obviously wouldn't be uh, reflected in this, but a year ago, we were one day away from the great nadir of the market. And who knew it at the time? You know, Christmas Eve, the great sell off, ball spiked. We actually came into, everyone forgets, we came into 2019 with the VIX around 25. <laughs> we were at a much higher regime back then. Obviously, it was unsustainable. We kind of came off pretty quickly. It wasn't this new era of higher volatility north of 20. But still, we came into this year roaring like a lion. We're going out kind of like a lamb. And uh, interesting stuff. Let's see how all this volatility at the start of the year and now kind of dwindling towards the end of the year, how that's playing out here from an overall volume perspective. If you're coming into today looking for some action on the VIX front, you might as well go home. Not a heck of a lot going out there. 63,000 contracts on the tape as of just a few minutes ago. The ADV still shy of 500K, about 486. Heck of a lot higher, about 100,000 higher than it was a couple of weeks ago. So that's nice, but uh, still shy of where it usually is. Of course, it's seasonal quiet time, so not exactly surprising. Spy at about 1.3, actually doing decent paper out there for kind of a nothing day. The ADV about 2.6 million. The S, about 650,000 contracts on the tape. The ADV about almost one and a quarter million out there. The Q's at about 377,000 contracts. The ADV, again, just a tick under 500K out there. And the Russell, a.k.a. IWM, failing to even do 100K out there. The ADV is about 300K. Let's go out to the most actives. Let's see if we can find some fun out there today. Cost you a paltry 88,000 contracts to break into the top 10 today. That'll get you to Amazon level. Got mostly, looks like mostly names you're heard of and familiar with here in our top 10 today. Number nine, NVIDIA, 89,000 contracts on the tape. Number eight, Netflix, a buck oh three on the tape. Number seven, Micron, a buck ten on the tape. Number six, good old Microsoft, a buck seventeen. Number five, our friends across the street, Boeing, a buck sixty two. They're tied for number four with Facebook, also at a buck sixty two. And number three, AMD, three twelve. We jump up quite a bit. (laughs) <laughs> to 312 over there. That, that's, a, that's an impressive leap. AMD lighting it up yet again. Number two, Apple doing a fairly impressive 432,000 contracts on a fairly nothing day out there. But number one, we talked about it before, it cannot be outdone today. Tesla closing in on that 420 stock price. And of course, that means the options closing in on nearly 450,000 contracts out there. Number one with a bullet out there. Let's see where our biases are lurking in the paper today. Looks like 74% is leading the tape, and that is on the call side for Facebook. Today, outside of that, 72% for Microsoft, and then it's all pretty much in the 60s, which is kind of usually where we see it. Tesla actually pretty even, about 56% on the calls, 44% on the puts. So kind of both sides paper lighting it up out there. That kind of backs up what we've seen out there. You guys love it or you love to hate it. Either way, you like it, you talk about it, you trade it out there in tesla land all right let's see obviously not a lot of earnings lighting it up out there this week most of the major names uh, pretty much reported are taking the week off out here if you like some nuggets as we're kind of coming up on the end of the year if you like some nuggets on how things have been performing not just for the year before the decade a lot of people are out there crunching numbers crunching the list these this particular number is happening to come from investing.com but a lot of different places have crunched the numbers on the past decade Obviously, the decade not over. Still got a couple, <laughs> about a week and change left. Uh, but looking at the SPX, you know, uh, that's been kind of the horse to bet on over the past decade, particularly if you look at taking the dividends and, and piling them back in, which a lot of people do. It's over 250% now up for the decade. So one of the best decades in its history. Not quite the best. We'll get to that in a second. If you're wondering, they looked at some other aggregate asset classes like bonds. 
Um, not exactly a good time for them. They looked at the Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index that includes treasuries, a bunch of other things. That's actually up a paltry, a meager 47%. Our friend out there on TWIFO WTI, kind of a bit of a lost decade for that one. It's off 20% over the past decade. Uh, let's see here, some other interesting numbers. If you're wondering, is this the best decade in SPX history or S&P history? Not quite. It's up there, though. Dating back to the 40s, that's the data they have. The best decade, you could probably guess what was the best decade, the go-go 90s. The S&P was up over 300%. And the 50s and the 80s, both of them were in the similar range where they are right now, north of 200%. So it's certainly up there for a great decade, but not quite the best. If you're wondering what was driving that, take, out, take a guess. It was tech, up over 300%. Consumer discretionary is also looking pretty good, also up 300%. Obviously, energy, kind of the laggard there. It was actually up, the energy sector but just barely up about 4.5% over the course of the past year. Interesting stuff out there. If they want the best best gainers for the decade, actually Netflix, interesting, up 4,100%. Again, all these names were not around a decade ago, so it's kind of hard to measure the span of a decade. A lot of the hot names we're talking about today, like Teslas and others, are kind of hard to get a decade's worth of data on them. Apache was the worst, down 80% over that 10-year time. Okay, so this is a few interesting little nuggets. And since we're talking some nuggets and some names, our to-be-reviewed, to-be-watched column has been overflowing since we've been adding so many names to it. So let's pay a few of those off now with a little bit of the old odd block. Time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. everybody welcome to the odd block this kind of one of the year end <laughs> review shows we're doing not quite looking back at the full year yet but looking at some of the names we've talked about recently and see how they've fared so mr rock lobster did you put on your proper reviewing pants for today sir <laughs> i i did actually I, instead of my pants being on backwards i put them on straight today there you go that's usually a good first step in the morning i find to uh, starting your day off right is putting your pants on the right way uh, let's kick things off let's actually not go back too far Let's go back a mere week. So even your mentally challenged memory there, Mr. Rothops, should be able to recall this one. Uh, this was Nike. We talked about them a week ago on the 16th here on the show. And they were, someone was piling in, looks like for some pretty strong pre-earnings call love. At the time, Nike was about to announce earnings. They had them on the 19th. It was three days after this. And we profiled someone coming in for the Dees 102 calls. That was a little bit out of the money at the time this trade went up. This trade went up on the 16th. The stock closed at 99.81 on that day. Someone piling into 11,250 of the Dees 102s for 76 cents. Worth noting, this print was late. It was up, so the market was 73 at 74. So we have to intuit a little bit what was going on. But it did much, a bunch of size did go up on that day. Total of 18,000. Also worth noting, as we talked about on the show that day, they did these calls tied to stock and. I tend to like that a little bit less. I think the Rock Lobster concurred with that as well because uh, it makes it another obstacle to kind of overcome. As you're already trading earnings, so it's a bit of a crapshoot, and now you're adding the stock leg to it now, and it makes things a little bit more challenging. Uh, looking here, that was the big day, 18000 We did see more go up, ironically, more trading on this stock on the uh, 19th, 8000 more, but that was actually additive because the OI gapped up from about 13000 to about 17000 Almost 18,000. So people were piling in with a day to go. And on the day of expiration, the 20th, only a little bit less than 3,000 actually traded. So these were pretty much uh, still open on expiration because the stock never really got there. Remember we said on the show, listeners, when you're doing them tied, obviously the customer probably buying the calls. So they're selling stock against it. They're hedging out the delta component. I don't have the delta here. They did it. I'm going to assume they did it delta neutral, not one to one. That's the more common way to do this. If they did it that way, effectively, you're taking out that Delta component, which is where most people are actually coming for in the earnings. Usually, they're looking to swing for that Delta component. You're taking that away. You're trading effectively the pure vol. I know saying that on a contract that's going away pretty soon, kind of hard to say vol, but it's an earnings trade. So, we know, you have a lot of that pent-up vol that's probably going to come out pretty hard 
after that fact, which makes this trade even harder <laughs> to pay off. Uh, so yeah, the stock didn't really go his way. It got close. It peaked out on one oh at one oh one fifteen on the nineteenth. So getting there, but not quite. And then coming into expiration, there's up about seventeen thousand, almost eighteen thousand and change. So it looks like Mr. Rock Lobster, it seems like, hindsight being twenty twenty, this guy took a bath on these, and these calls pretty much went out worthless. It never, it never passed 102, never really got close. Uh, so it looks like if we just look at it straight up on the option, just on that one print he did, he lost not quite a million, pretty close, about 850000 on the options. Obviously, we don't know the stock uh, in terms of what he did with it after we know where he sold it, but we don't know if he still has it. If he does still have it, he's out about $0.40 cents on the stock as well, <laughs> so he's probably down Somewhere around a million on this trade, all things considered. That's not even counting the other contracts that went up after the fact, which puts this up probably north of one and a half million. Again, this print was late, so it's, we have to do a little bit of the, the tea, re, tea leave reading here to, to intuit what was going on. But it seems like that was the case. Mr. Rock Lobster, are you on board with that train as well? You think this guy pretty much bought these, did them with stock, and looks like they probably didn't work out in his favor, sir? I think uh, the way it looks to me, I think the guy ate a poof sandwich. He put it on and poof, it all went to nothing. He, you know what? He could have just listened to our show for free. He could have got that information for free. That was a tough trade for Nike. Um, it's one of those, uh, you know, when you're trading options versus stock, which is actually uh, a trade that I like a lot. Uh, but you really need like that big real, you need a big move to make it work. Um, Earnings that can happen. Um, I don't think it was an unreasonable bet for Nike, but um, it it just did not happen at all. So I think, uh, you know, sometimes, too, you could lose twice depending on where the stock was because um, you got the options don't rally enough. And then your short stock rallies in your face. And you all know and you remember what that feels like when uh, volatility compresses and the stock goes up and uh you get you get drilled twice. It's a pleasant feeling. The joyous feeling. This, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's when you go to series early in the day and just like I'm done. <laughs> yeah, it's like let's see, we, it opens eight thirty and you're there at ten thirty because it's not going to get any better. Yeah, I, I knew my guys were having a bad day. And I, Where are you? Oh, I'm at series and it was like nine forty two. I'm like, oh, this is noth- <laughs> nothing good is happening for them on this day. <laughs> All right, let's keep on rolling. So yeah, we're going to factor that guy in the. Uh, looks like he lost some money. Camp probably. Probably around a million bucks, maybe more, all told, if you look at the later later paper as well. Let's see if we can uh, if we can turn things around a bit, Mr. Rock Lobster. Next up, you recall this one as well. This is actually a pretty recent one as well. This is back on the 2nd of December. You remember this one, Mr. Rock Lobster? It was this REIT put Palooza in these like uh, these outlet mall REITs. You remember this one? I do. Wasn't there like two or three put sales? Yeah, there were, there, there, of of there were three of them. There were three of them. We're like, what's going on with these? And someone pointed out in our chat that they had been all been profiled in bearings. In bearings. In bearings. Bearings. I'm going back now. Bearings is gone. Bearings. <laughs> bearings over the weekend here. So let's see how these fared. These all went up on December 2nd, listeners. There's a bunch of looks like looked like line in the sand puts here. Let's start off with the first one. It was Tanger Factory Outlet Centers. Someone blasting away on nearly 14,000, 13,828. The D's 15 puts doing these for 21 cents. Remember at the time, listeners, we kind of speculated it seemed like someone, these are all pretty close to the money, it seemed like someone maybe was looking to pick up some stock in these REITs. Let's see how this fared. Tanger at the time closed at 1567, so a little bit north of that 15 strike, but clearly close to the fire. It could have happened. On expiration, actually, it did happen. The stock closed at fourteen ninety. So these puts went out in the money about a dime. Uh, worth noting, there were about eighteen thousand of these still open on expiration. Only about forty five hundred traded that day, so not enough to clear out the total OI, let alone the nearly fourteen thousand that printed on that one one day there as well. So a lot went up on the trade day, and they were still open. So it looks like someone, Mister Rock Lobster. Bought himself some stock <laughs> for around about fourteen seventy nine or so. If that's the case, he's probably regretting it already because the stock's down about fourteen half right now. So he's down oh about another twenty nine cent, twenty six cents or so on this trade already. So so far, Mister Rock Lobster, it seems like we're kind of oh for one. But hey, it looks like this guy probably wanted the stock. Are you on board with that one as well, sir? I I think so. By the way, all like this this whole re- retail concept thing. This is a big you know. I love it when they the market hates a whole sector 
Like they're literally saying this sector is done. It's kind of like the oil patch right now. Um, I haven't done anything in it, it, but I'm, you know, now it's on my radar. I'm watching. So, but I, I think this person did want to own, um, own the stock and they wanted to own it at a better price. And so far they got their wish. So, uh, it is for sure. Uh, it's an, it's an interesting trade. And to be honest, like who knows what, you know, is, is the retail malls going away? Uh, is Amazon going to take over? I don't know. It's definitely a, um, as a trade, it is interesting. I have not done anything with it yet, but it's, it is starting to call me a little bit, I have to admit. Yeah, it does seem like someone read that Barron's article and said, hey, you know, I think this sector is overdone, and I'm going to buy all of it because he wrote puts in a bunch of it. <laughs> so, yeah, he, it's hard to say it's a winner or a loser. Near term, it's a loser, obviously, because the stock is down and the puts expired in the money. But he obviously wanted the stock, so he got what he wanted. So we'll see if, he's, if he feels this whole sector is a little overbeaten down. And it could be long-term looking pretty good. Let's look at the next one, see how this one fared. This was in Maceric. I think that's how you pronounce it. M-A-C-E-R-I-C-H. Maceric, maybe. Uh, maybe Makarich, if we're getting old-school Greek on it, maybe. <laughs> but uh, let's go with Maceric. And let's see. That is ticker symbol M-A-C. Someone also blasts an outline in the sand there. Interesting numbers here. 12,316 of those. The D25 puts for 16 cents right off the bid there as well. On the day of the trade, the stock closed right around 26 and a half. And on expiration day, it was pretty much the same, about 26 and a half. So the stock never really moved. So it seemed like it never really threatened the 25 handle either. So it seems like our friend here, he ended up picking up the 16 cents this time. So maybe he didn't get the stock that he wanted, but he got nearly 200K on the trade. Worth noting, someone came in and added more the next day. We profiled, there were about 12, almost 13,000 going up on the second. Another almost 9,000 trading on the third. Most of that was additive. The OI grew, so... Uh, someone liked it more the next day. So someone drew a pretty aggressive line in the sand, and it didn't really get hit. So someone pocketed around 200k on that initial trade. The other eight grand, another probably a couple hundred, another buck, buck or so on that. So yeah, this guy's looking alright at least from a premium perspective. But he didn't get the stock he wanted. So I guess that that's going to color your viewpoint a little bit. And then last but not least, we've got Taubman Centers Inc. These were also lined the sand puts. Oh, by the way, Macer right now trading 26 and a quarter, so still north of that 25 handle. So our friend always has time to uh, come back out and write those again. Now we got Taubman Centers, Inc. This is ticker symbol TCO, another REIT that invests in outlet malls. Uh, someone coming in blasting away on the DS30 puts for 22 cents, 6,413 times on the day of the trade, which was also the same day, the second we saw the stock closing right around 32 bucks, 31.99 on expiration. It closed a wee bit, a wee bit south of that, 30.35, and it actually broke through the 30 handle ever so briefly on the 17th of December. So, in the lifespan of these options, this guy was sweating a little bit. If he did indeed, well, if he just was tight and selling the puts, he was sweating. If he wanted the stock, then maybe he was all right, but it was still below his level. It was down to 12.59 on the 17th. So, obviously. He was a little bit below where he sold those puts for. Worth noting, these bad boys uh, were still open at expiration because the stock rallied back north of the 30 handle. Again, close to it, 30.35. So he was threatening to pin for a little bit there on expiration, but the stock closed north of it. There were still about 11,000 of these bad boys open. Uh, so it seems like our friend here sweated it out, but it ended up working out in the end. He pocketed about a buck 41 for his trouble. So Mr. Rock Lobster looks like he lost... Oh, what do we say about? Uh, well, he lost. We got his stock, but he lost some money on the uh, on the on the on the Tanger ones. And but then uh, Maserick and Taubman, he made. Oh, looks like nearly nearly two hundred k and about a buck fifty. So about three fifty. That makes up for the money he lost on the uh, on the Taubman one. There, or excuse me, the Tanger one. So what do you think overall on our friend line in the sand here? How do you think he feared? Um. I, I, it seems like he's doing okay, and he's taking that one, he, and he's got a little money in the bank against the loss at this point. Um, it, it feels like, too, this is like, uh, you know, like one of those end-of-year tax plays where stocks that everybody hates, um, um, you know, then at the end of the year, like, okay, people are going to take their tax loss there. It presses them lower, and by the first of the year, they kind of, they bought them and ripped back up. I mean, it's like it's a common end of the year trade. And just this is a sector right now. I mean, S&P 500 all-time highs, and these are just in the ash can basement. So 
it's possible that this person was smart, smart enough to, uh, you know, to trade that. It'll be interesting to see how it comes around. They're all at about the same. I mean, they're all mostly at about the low points that they've been trading. So uh, there's time. There's still time. Um, but uh, an interesting play nonetheless. I'm, I'm going to go into the camp of possibly around the end of the year tax loss thing, and then they might recover a little bit. And I think maybe I think that's what the person, the line in the sand person was hoping because it was a fairly aggressive line in the sand, but there's not a lot of juice in these things anyway. Um, but my, my gut says that it's going to end up being an okay trade. There's an article right now coming out a couple hours ago. Taubman's tenants are selling record amounts. <laughs> Tenant sales were up again, marking the 13th consecutive quarter of growth. So maybe our fellow here is looking for some stock. Maybe he was on to something. Meanwhile, let's see if you guys are on to something with a little bit of your mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, everybody. Monday, usually a bit of strategery. Uncle Mike on holiday assignments. We thought we'd open it up to you guys to end the year here with a few more of your questions. Also, like to pick the brains of the Fidelity Legions out there, see what you have on the brain. And Mr. Last Emperor, it sounds like the Fidelity Legions have uh, the old DNE, the, the old do not exercise, kind of an arcane one. They have this on the brain these days, Mr. Last Emperor? Yeah, guys. So I wanted to dedicate um, a little bit of time today to discussing this because it does come up um, actually a lot more frequently than you would imagine. Um, me uh, and Trey sit pretty close to uh, to our trading desk, and uh, we actually, you know, at least one once every Friday here um, hear a call coming in from a client requesting that. So let me kind of back. Uh, backtrack a little bit. When I was on the show on Thursday, um, I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that quadruple witching was coming up on Friday the 20th, and that meant that SPY was going ex-dividend. So, you know, very important to understand that if you're short options going into a dividend event or an ex-dividend date, um, and they're deep in the money, you are you know, running a much greater chance um, of, of being assigned early. And in fact, right, it, it happens. It happens every single quarter and someone you know, gets hurt. Uh, in, in, in an example uh, that actually was um, a conversation that was had um, on Friday was a situation where a gentleman was short some deep in the money call spreads on SPY and going into the event and, you know, didn't decide to roll them out, got assigned. Uh, of course, you're short stock, right, overnight, and uh, you're going to owe that dividend to the contra party. Now, granted, Friday was a very positive day. Um, SPY rallied, I think, and, and took back uh, most of that ex dividend adjustment, relatively speaking. It paid a buck fifty seven. And the stock rallied to the to the top side. So if you were short stock and you still had your long calls that you didn't exercise, uh, you probably got most of that money back, at least that you would have to pay right to the uh, to the person uh, who you owe the dividend to. But it's you know it's a situation that you definitely want to avoid because it creates you know all sorts of issues. Um, there might be even a possibility of of your account not being able to you know support. Uh, a you know a position size that you're controlling through options, and you know sometimes maybe you can't even find stock to short, right? So you get bought back in at a time where um, you know you, you potentially wouldn't be preferring to do so. So it creates a you know kind of a, a big you know a serious bump in the road, uh, depending on the circumstance, right? The, the the market didn't have to rally on Friday. And kind of uh, uh, save the situation. They s- s- save the day, right? Because as a long call holder, you don't benefit from a dividend, dividend payment. So the market kind of uh, bailed that that person out, uh, which worked out. But it doesn't always work out that way. And if you go back and look at all the quarterly dividends, 
obviously you can see those adjustments in the chart. So be aware. Um, if you don't want to deal with that scenario, all the complexity behind it, just roll out the position, right? If, if, you, if you have the position on um, and it clearly didn't work out because of your original strategy, have an, you know, an exit strategy in mind of some sort. And if you don't have an exit strategy, um, at least make sure that you have time on your hand, right? So um, all sorts of uh, problems arise, and, and that goes into the do not exercise side of things. So the question always is, is what, what are the chances of me getting assigned early? Well, we know that if we're trading American-style options, you could uh, be assigned at any time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the transaction has to make financial sense, right? If you're looking at uh, your short option and you still have time value in that option, we have seen situations, right, where you get assigned even if there was time value in, in, in the option, right? It doesn't make financial sense, but it happens. Um, here at Fidelity, we have uh, a random process of, uh, of assigning. So... Uh, the Options Clearing Corporation obviously sends out the notification to all the brokerage houses that um, have short contracts, right? And then, you know, each brokerage house has its own process. Uh, for Fidelity, it's, it's a randomized process, so we're not choosing and picking who is getting assigned, but just rather randomly assigning an account. Um, but, you know, folks normally ask, like, hey, what if, um, you know, what, what if I am long call contracts and my account cannot actually handle, right, in, in, in size um, an exercise, for example, right, going into a Friday expiration or in a case of SPY, a Monday or Wednesday or a Friday, uh, depending which one you're trading, right? If you want to be in control of selling the option contract at any moment, um, taking that action yourself, right? What generally um, the brokers would suggest is, listen, if your, your account cannot handle the exercise, which we know that if, if an option is at least a penny in the money at expiration, you will be um, exercising your right to buy the stock, right? Or to be shorting a stock if you're long a put. Um, and, you know, if, if, if the account is too small, um, the margin clerks generally kind of get on uh, those accounts and, and, and get the notifications up. And, you know, if the client is not taking action on their own, the account's too small, doesn't have enough cash, right? they would sell the contract in the open market uh, on your behalf, right? So there's some folks out there that say, well, you know what? I don't want a margin clerk to be in control of my account. I actually want to be in control and I want to be trading that contract, you know, all the way through four o'clock. I don't know. I don't want to sell right now. I want to hold it until I'm blue in the face, right? Um, if that's the case, you can request the do not exercise instructions to be put onto your account. What that means is if you get them put on, you forfeit, right, any right to purchase the stock or short the stock, depending on whether you own a long call or a long put. And there was a real situation just this Friday where um, a client apparently was long uh, some very deep in the money Netflix options, call options. I think that there were 40 points in the money or so. Cole then requested the do not exercise instructions put on, but uh, forgot to actually sell the contracts in the open market. So, you know, what happens, right? You forfeit your right to buy the stock. All of that intrinsic value is basically up in flames. Um, you need to understand that if you do put in the do not exercise instructions, it is 100% on you to make sure that you're actually selling out of the position before the close of business. I would suggest not even pushing it that far, right? If you, and that goes back to the exit strategy discussion. Um, if you're trading an option that is expiring that day and you're waiting for the last minute or the last moment to trade it, you know, what, what is going to be the circumstance that you're dealing with? What is going to be the bid offer spread, um, you know, 15 minutes or half an hour before the close or five minutes before the close? Um, you're only, you know, able to trade out of the contract, especially if you're trading size uh, or sell the contracts for whatever someone else is willing to pay for it. So you're in the mercy of, you know, that, that circumstance of, of the liquidity provider or market maker making sure that, you know, they're taking the other side of the trade. 
Um, obviously, more you know, liquid underlings probably uh, don't face you know similar troubles. But um, I, I would say that have an exit strategy ahead of time, regardless of whether you're making money or losing money. Um, if you want to be prolonging right the strategy from the perspective of time, make sure that you roll right, um, adjust it in some way to make sure you're not dealing with those strange circumstances at the end of the day. And God forbid, putting do not exercise instructions on and then forgetting to sell the contracts, right? Thinking that you're going to own the stock because it's in the money. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, part mail block, part troubles that we see every single quarter on underlyings like SPY and QQQ and IWM. Because uh, those particular underlyings, we know that the, the dividend uh, quarterly's quarterly dividend is coming. It just doesn't get an, doesn't get announced by by companies, right? If you go to a State Street website and you're trying to look for the specific date on which SPY is going to be going ex dividend, it's nowhere to be found. Um, you could look at historical payments and say, okay, this is generally when it pays that quarterly. Um, so you know, it, it, it's a tough business if you're not used to trading and underlying make sure that you know everything about it before you put the position on Uh, so that's just kind of a word of advice from myself being a trader on the desk i got uh the strategy desk position and you know happens a lot more frequently than you would imagine Uh, and, and it's not necessarily something that you want to deal with definitely not let's look in here Kind of come up against it, see if we have any any short questions. A lot of yours are pretty lengthy, calculating margin, time decay, uh, Canadian credit spreads, all sorts of interesting stuff. I think we'll get to them. I think we'll do like a listener mail palooza to wrap up the year next year or next year, next week <laughs> on the show here as well. So we'll get to a lot of those. We'll, we'll wrap it up here with, uh, with some quick ones, comments. This one comes from YouTube from Mars Jane on our show. It says, neat. Well, glad you like it there, Mars Jane. It is funny to me how many of you are consuming the shows now via YouTube. Hey, if you like it, go for it. It's not our go-to platform, really. It's not really how we envision the show being consumed. But if you like it, again, it's kind of an automated ancillary function of our distribution platform. They also put it out to YouTube. If you like it that way, go for it. More the merrier. And if you think it's neat, like Mars Jane, well then, glad you guys are liking it. Meanwhile, it's time for us to keep on rolling to our final segment. It is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Let's do it. It's time to go around the block. We're going to go a little bit farther than we normally do this time, because usually we go till later on in the week when we come back on Thursday, but we'll be taking the day after Christmas off here on the network so uh, we're going to go a little bit farther all the way out to next monday so let's start with the rock lobster mr rock lobster sir what is on your radar for the entirety of the next holiday week and through the weekend until we gather back here together on monday sir um that's a good question i'm just i'm watching uh the same stuff i was last week is are we uh is is the market pre-bought in protection, which I kind of feel that it is, um, at least the way I measure this kind of stuff. Um, and will the rally hold till the next trade announcement? So I think other, up into the end of the year, unless there's something to upset the apple cart, I feel like that's where we are. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's about it, really. I mean, I think it's a bull market. In general, bull market calls are your friend. Um, I, I watched a lot of crazy bull markets in my life, at least two or three of them. And um, ultimately, you know, low vol, stocks moving up, just don't get too, don't get in the way of a, of, a, of a moving freight train. So, you know, options level bull market, and that's as far as I know right now, that's what we have. Bull market that's lasted a decade and up 250%. So why get in the way of a good thing? Mr. Last Emperor, same question for you. What is on your radar for the entirety of this week until we all gather here together one final time for the year and indeed for the decade next Monday, sir? Yeah, guys, I, uh, I'm definitely watching the market. I, I was mentioning uh, last week, Andrew, that even with that 23-24 handle VIX uh, going into uh, Christmas last year, right, we still, I guess, uh, have an outside 
outsized move to the to the upside in the S and P. So uh, that if that tells you something, right? Straddle Straddle is pricing it up or down twenty three percent based on where VIX was or spikes or the implied volatility of of the spiders, whichever measure you were looking at, right? You're uh, you're up a lot a lot more than that. Um, so again, right? A definition of higher highs, higher lows along the way. Um, you know, with was just continuation uh, to to the top side. So, like you said, um, Andrew, right? Bull, bull markets. You don't want to be getting uh, in front of it, right? If um, if you're if you're foaming at the mouth trying to find an opportunity to short, make sure that you're you know going short at least on confirmation uh, of of a stall or a pause. Um, look for evidence of the fact that sellers are in fact uh, in control before you do so. You don't want to be the first guy trying to uh, to find the top or or, or pick a top. Um, I am uh, going to be looking for jobless claims on Thursday. Uh, I am off for the rest of the week as well, and uh, I I, I want to wish all the listeners happy holidays and, and merry Christmas, and um, you know hope to talk to you guys soon. I'll probably be on back on Monday when I when we get back. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll reconvene and see where we end the year. All right, listeners, that music means that we come to the end, but we're not done yet for the entire year. No, no, no. <laughs> we'll be back next Monday to break down the highs and lows of the year. Tell you what we're looking ahead to to the future. Also, probably open it up to you guys. See what you guys have on the old brains here to wrap up the year. So just a reminder, no crypto later today as well. No crypto rundown. Actually going to be recording some other stuff here in the studio instead. So don't uh, look for that one. We'll be back for that one soon as well. And of course, no option block on Thursday. No TWIFO on Thursday. No ball views on Friday. Taking the rest of the week off. People, people here on the network have families too they need to go back to and hang out with. So we'll be back next week doing all that good stuff. But before we go, let's go back around the horn, check in with everybody, see what they have cooking that may interest you. Let's start with the Rock Lobster. Mr. Rock Lobster, I'm intrigued. I want to learn more. Maybe I want someone to explain to me how I could write my own puts in uh, in outlet mall REITs. Where should I go? What should I do? Uh, go to optionpit.com. Uh, go to our uh, memberships page. You can see all the goodies that we have and get your option learning on. There you go. Get your option learning on optionpit.com is the place to go. They also option pit on YouTube as well. They also like the old YouTubes. If I put out more than we do, well, actually, we put out a lot automatically <laughs> via YouTube, not intentionally. <laughs> but still interesting stuff. Check them out over there. Optionpit.com is the place to go. And Mr. Last Emperor, if they want to kick the tires and light the fires over there in Fidelity Land, where should they go? What should they do? Fidelity.com forward slash options, open an account, uh, apply for options trading. Of course, once you become a customer, you're more than welcome to uh, give me or uh, any one of my colleagues a ring. Uh, I'll be delighted to talk to you one-on-one, whatever it is that you have in mind. Hopefully, you're not going to be dealing with a circumstance where you are short a bunch of deep-in-the-money options going into an ex-dividend date, right? If you... <laughs> If you want to avoid those types of situations um, and you want to learn more, uh, give us a call. Uh, you could also find us at fidelity.com forward slash coaching for all the options coaching that we do here. There you go. Fidelity.com slash options is the place to go to begin your journey. And if you are a Fidelity client, fidelity.com slash coaching. Also a place to go to continue your journey over there. And on behalf of the last emperor and the rock lops and even Uncle Mike and indeed myself, I thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing. Remember, we'll be off later this week. We'll be back on Monday for more of the Option Block. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. 
Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 